Today I'm going to be taking a look at the DOD, or is that DOD, Champion SP1 Motorsport Dash Cam. If we look at the specs on the back of the box first of all to kick off, you can see at the top there we've got the different video resolution options. It says it's got a 140 degree lens, it records in MOV file format, uses a micro SD card up to a maximum of 32 gigs in size. We've got the dimensions on there, the weights, and at the bottom importantly the operating temperatures, which as you can see go from quite cold to quite hot. Now why is this a motorsport dash cam? Well if you look at the side of the box you can see it's got options for measuring things that you might do if you're using a vehicle on a racetrack. Acceleration times, lap times, braking distance times, all the kind of stuff that you might do if you use your vehicle on a track day. Looking at what you get inside the box, well, my camera's been provided by the official UK distributor who offer a one-year guarantee. That's the card for that. We've got a mini CD here containing the software. Got the power lead, which is 4 metres or 13 feet in length. Uh, that ends a 12 or 24 volt adapter, which outputs, of course, 5 volts, 1.5 amps into that USB mini B socket there, or plug, I should say. In addition, we've got the instruction booklet here, which is a nice one. It's just in English, this, because, again, I mentioned this is the one just for the UK. So, nice thin booklet, but everything you need in here, and very nicely documented, good illustrations in there. It's nice and clear. And then, in addition to that, we've got two different mounts. First off, we've got this one, which is an adhesive mount. You'd, of course, leave that in your car. Once you put it in there, you can't remove it. And it's got the usual ball joint and kind of clip mechanism to hold the camera to your car. And then this one with a suction cup. That's more suitable if you were going to use it on a track day in some sort of car that you'd borrow for the day. Just suction cup that to the windscreen. And then, of course, we've got the camera itself. Now, if we just have a look around this, first thing, of course, take off the protective lens covering. That's just for use in transit. Don't leave that on there, of course. And then round the back also, we've got a little bit of film on the screen there. Now, you can see below the lens, we've got vents either side, which should help it to work in hotter environments. The lens itself looks like it's sort of adjustable or something. It isn't. That's just aesthetic reasons. But it does have a little bit of a cowl on the top, which might stop the sun getting into the lens in the wrong angles there. There's your USB mini B socket. We've got the AV out, which is a standard def AV, of course. We don't have a lead like that in the box, though. We've got the power on off button there and then the start stop or shutter button on the right hand side. On the top of course you can see the bit where the uh, different mounts go into that and of course that's also your GPS antenna which sticks up from the top there. We've got a nice large screen on the back here either side of which we're flanked with three buttons. If we flip it onto the side here you can see that's where the micro SD card goes. You'll have to provide your own up to 32 gigs. Use a class 10 card so here's mine and of course it just goes in following the little picture there in the right orientation slides down inside there it's a spring-loaded slot and you've got to push it quite away in there it's quite a deep slot that one so you can see just get it in there now and then you cover it up with that little bit of uh, rubber there okay now if you flip it around on the other side similar thing but this one has got a mini HDMI out and of course we've got a little reset hole there as well Right, I'll just switch it on so we can see how it operates. So I'm going to turn it on, pressing the button there, it'll come on pretty quickly. It's running on battery power at the moment. Obviously, normally you use this using that power adapter inside your vehicle. Now, let's have a look around the outside of the screen. You can see there's quite a lot of information there. One thing that you might notice flashing on the right hand side is the satellite symbol. And that's because it's trying to get a GPS lock but it's inside the house, so it's going to take it a while. It will actually pick one up, believe it or not. Now, that microphone symbol, press it there. You can see I can switch the mic on and off very easily. Top right is the battery indicator. We'll probably get maybe 15 minutes of battery life out of this as a maximum. And then I'll show you how to go through the different modes. So we're in the video mode at the moment. Press the M button for the modes. Next one along, photos. If you want to take a still picture, press it again. That's the playback mode. And then press it once more, we're back into that video mode, which is where it spends most of its time, of course. If we get back into that playback mode, I'll just select a video clip that I recorded earlier on in the car. So this one will do. Press the top right button to select it. As you can see, it's playing on that nice large screen there. We've got the option to fast forward if we want to get to a particular part in the clip or rewind, of course. And because it's running on battery, it enables you to take the camera out of the car, perhaps show it to a policeman or something without having to sit inside your vehicle, powering it from the lighter socket. Now, if we just go through the different menus at the top you can see that little indicator there that's the menu button so if I tap that first one is the very setup options I'll go through these later on um, I'll show you the interesting ones at least but if we press it twice we get into the motorsport menu now these are the kind of things that you use during that 
track day type activity so let's see what we've got here so 0 to 100 kilometers per hour timer 100 to 200 60 to 250 not to 60 miles per hour not to 120 miles per hour and uh, not to 400 meters timer and then we've got some braking distance timers there as well lap timers which you do a lap of a track and it'll work out obviously the laps you have to set a start and finish at the bottom there and then shortcut setup see the red button at the bottom left you can pick what you want on that red button that just takes you straight into whichever option you've chosen so say we want the 0 to 400 meters timer on that red button let's just pick it from the options here there it is at the bottom so select that right now that's now moved on to that red button so if we ever need that in a hurry we can just press the red button i'll just carry on around this top menu though so first one was that the second one was the motorsport stuff the third one's more kind of general camera things like formatting menus now let's press that red button and you can see there you go that's a 0 to 400 meters timer notice can't use it at the moment because it hasn't got that gps lock on with it being inside the house of course finally that emergency button on the middle left there if we press that you'll notice a padlock appear on the screen here so i press that that means the current file that's being recorded will get moved into a separate folder on the camera and therefore won't be overwritten when the card's full and it gets looped over the top of now we'll just switch it off because I want to show you how quickly it starts up so imagine this is in your car now this is a powered USB lead we turn the car on and you can see the light comes on straight away you get that warning message popping up at the beginning but it does start recording very quickly this one compared to some cameras I've used see we've got the red light flashing already little indicator at the top left the little uh, LED also flashes as well when it's recording now I've just unplugged that it does take a few seconds longer of course to shut down which is a good thing it, it gives it enough time to save the file that's being recorded to the memory card and then shut down gracefully okay so that's going through the basic settings of it I think we should have a look at some footage that we've recorded with the camera now so I'm going to show you some sample clips I do have downloadable samples available sometimes people mention oh I had a look at your downloadable samples I stream them they look terrible no they're not for streaming you're supposed to download them hence the word download download them to your computer play them from there to see the true quality now obviously you're watching this streamed on YouTube so there's more than likely going to be a few little artifacts appearing in the video as I go through detailed scenes perhaps some blocking things like that but one thing you should be able to get from the video even on YouTube is the fact that the camera coats particularly well in all sorts of different lighting conditions I've got quite a few different samples to show you taken at different times of the day either early in the morning or early evening or in the dark so while I'm playing through those I just want to mention this camera has come from the official UK distributor of the DOD or DOD cameras. Now that does not mean that this is an advertisement for this camera. They just sent it to me to do one of my normal reviews on. Obviously they've got confidence in their products. I've reviewed DOD cameras in the past and they always tend to be well-made devices. So they'd be as surprised as I would be if something was wrong with this camera. However, if there was anything wrong with it, I'd certainly bring it up and draw it to your attention and to theirs as well. Some of these manufacturers actually like me to test these things because I tend to find things that are wrong with them that they didn't even notice were there themselves now during these videos I always like to show you every feature of the camera as well as lots of different video situations and then you can download the clips and make your own mind up whether or not it's the camera for you no pressure sales going on here I'm just presenting all the evidence then it's entirely down to you whether or not you believe me and whether or not you think this camera is suitable for you I've got to say though this is a bit of a premium camera kind of upmarket one more expensive than the cheaper cameras that I sometimes review which is why it's nice to be able to get one in to review it and demonstrate it to you without having to spend any money now I just want to mention something about the sound on the camera so I'm going to do a little bit of uh, audio stuff for you here but one thing I also want to show you during this clip is how the clips join together so I've been recording two minute clips I've stitched two together here and you'll be able to see in this clip when and where it jumps between clips because my voice jumps and the video jumps so let's have a listen Right, so we're doing the nighttime test now, and it's also a good opportunity to do a, to do a test of the microphone on the camera as well. So the sound that you're listening to now has been recorded on the camera itself. So hopefully this is coming through nice and clear. Now on the nighttime test, we're going to go through three different areas. That was the town area with the uh, better lighting. We're going to go through a bit more of an urban area with some street lights, and then we're going to go through an area with uh, no lights at all other than of course the car headlights.
I should have said that the second area is more rural rather than urban, but it's hard to drive and talk at the same time sometimes. But as I'm going through these different areas, I'll mention what happened there with a little bit of a jump. What happens is each new clip that you record repeats a fraction of a second of the end of the previous clip. And the idea is, of course, I suppose, that you're not going to miss anything because you're not missing anything between clips. But it also means you get a little bit of a jump when you join them together sometimes, or a repeat, I should say. You see here, we've got the full beam on. I'll just knock it down as I get to this corner to the uh, normal dip beam, and you can see the difference there. But as you can see, nighttime recording or recording in areas with no lights at all is actually quite impressive especially when I put my uh, full beam back on again in a second here you better see a little bit more as to what's going on I was uh, afraid I was gonna dazzle someone coming over the hill there but they weren't there in the end now the thing that sets this particular camera apart from other dash cams are its motorsport features now ironically those are things that don't really interest me much I don't do track days or motor racing but I do know there's lots of people out there that do because they get in touch with me and they've asked me in the past what camera would I recommend they take along well I think now I'd probably recommend this one there's lots of different options as we mentioned earlier on things you can measure I've got a link in the video description to the manual so you can have a read through that but I'll pass over to me in the car and I'll just test out one of those features now. Now this camera has a lot of features for track days I don't have a track to go around but I've got a bit of a secluded country lane I'm going to try out the 0 to 60 function I'm not going to really floor it it's a damp day besides which I'm not that kind of person but we'll test it out anyway and see how it goes so the first thing I have to do is to press the button at the bottom here and hold it down and it says 0 to 60 timer so all I need to do now now it's showing is zero. As soon as I set off, it'll start timing it. So let's see how we do. Wow, seven seconds. Now that was a little bit faster than I was anticipating going. However, it does seem very possible because the car can do it in 6.4 according to the manual. Now the whole thing does rely on satellite GPS coordinates and the distance that you travel over a set amount of time. Now, if it hasn't got a good lock, as in it hasn't locked onto a number of different satellites, you'll find things happening like this at the bottom where it says my best time at 0 to 60 was 0.7 seconds. So let's have a look at that record breaking run now. And that was it. Obviously something went wrong there. And I think what was happening was whilst it had got the satellite indicator locked so that it enabled me to do the tests, it hadn't locked onto a number of satellites. And therefore, it was getting weird information. Let me show you what that looks like. If you haven't got a proper lock on, see here on screen, it's showing I'm doing single digit miles per hour. That goes up to teens. It jumps all of a sudden. And that's probably when it locks onto a new satellite. So I suggest drive around a little bit before doing any of these kind of tests. Otherwise, your results might be a little bit odd. Now, how accurate these results are, I really don't know. But if you went on a track day with a stopwatch, I'm sure you could find out pretty easily. Now, let's have a look at the different menus and options in the camera. So you may recall from earlier on, to get into the menus, press the top right button. Now, the top option, wide dynamic range, you can only have it as on. There's no other option. So just leave that as it is. Next one down, resolutions. I've recorded all my video in the top one, which is 1080p 30. Now, the next two options, exposure and white balance, I just left as auto throughout all the video tests. And then record audio would be the same as pressing that mic button on the front of the camera to switch it on or off. You can turn the date stamp on or off. And then in loop recording, you can select the length of the segments from 2, 3, 5, 20 minutes or off would we'll record 4 gig files, I believe. G sensor sensitivity, I always set this low to avoid the camera automatically locking files when I drive over potholes. Show you how that works. That's low sensitivity. Look for the padlock at the bottom left of the screen. It's still not locked. It really requires a bit of a shake before it finally locks the file that's being recorded. So that's a good thing for me anyway. Motion detection. I'm often asked why I dismiss this option in my videos and never really go into detail. Well, I'll show you now. If you switch it on, for example, look in the manual. Here's what you have to do. It's for use when you're parked, not when you're driving. You've got to therefore have the camera powered when you park because the battery will last, say, 10 minutes or so. And then you've also got to switch it off again before you start driving. Otherwise, it'll mess up your video. So... This is an option that's just not worth switching on or even mentioning for that matter. Plate stamp, you can put your own registration number in there. That's what I put in mine. You'll have seen that at the bottom of the videos. Driver fatigue warning, it's going to beep every interval there. GPS logging, whether you want the GPS on or off. So you get the information, the coordinates showing on your video. The head up display is an interesting option. You can choose the interval on screen here. 
after which the display on the camera is replaced with the information that you see here, which is the speed that the vehicle's going, as well as the compass at the top right. You can see it in action here. I find the information on here to be pretty accurate compared to the speedo in the car, perhaps maybe a second or so behind. You can choose to have a speed warning so that if your car exceeds the speed that you set in the menu here, the camera will beep at you. And then it's very important to set the time zone right. In the UK in summer, you'd have to set it plus one. It pulls the GPS time through, which is UTC time. Add on an hour, that becomes the UK time. It depends, of course, which country you're in that one. Just make sure you set it right. Now, the password setting, that's something where you can set it so the camera can't have its options and menus and settings changed unless you enter that password or the files deleted but of course there's nothing to prevent you getting the memory card out of the camera and deleting the files separately so perhaps not too much use that one the speed units you can set in miles per hour or kilometers per hour although i have noticed that doesn't go through every menu it's just certain menus that use that the image rotation turn it upside down 180 degrees now time lapse i'll show you what that looks like see the intervals here 200 milliseconds 500 milliseconds a second if we do one at 200 milliseconds what happens is it records a speeded up video so this is a 200 millisecond one now i don't really know how much use this would be as an accident camera because it might miss out the important bit of information but maybe if you wanted to record a long journey driving across country or something like that you might find that useful and you've got those different options as you see on screen there of course there's no sound with that file and path analysis when you drive the car and park up and stop the engine this displays on the screen for a few seconds to show you what you did during the course of the journey it gives you a bit of information uh, again it seems to still show in kilometers per hour even after i've changed the setting to miles per hour in that other menu and then ISO stamp, you might have noticed this in some of the videos earlier on. It's at the top left up there, it shows the exposure that the camera's uh, automatically setting. You see it's uh, quite good there, but at night time it goes up a bit. And watch what happens when I uh, flip on my full beam as well. Now notice the miles per hour also in the middle at the bottom there. I just want to mention that because I'll mention that again in a second. So let's go into this menu here, which is past that one. Right, format the card in the camera. Obviously, we know all about that one. Uh, language, go through those there. Those are the different options we've got. Date and time, if you're not using the GPS information, set it there. Flicker reduction, set it for your own country to stop lights flickering at the hertz. Uh, LED, I'll switch the LED light on on the camera. This is if you were taking the camera out of the car and taking a photo. You might want to use that LED light on the front there. As you can see, the option's buried right down in the menus. It's obviously not for using when taking video in the car. Turn the beep on or off. Screen saver, that blanks the screen off, so you don't want to use that at the same time as that other option that shows the speed, otherwise it'll just blank it off. Video output for the analog video outs, NTSC or PAL. Now, speed stamp. I mentioned the speed before. You can turn the speed stamp on or off. Some clips had it on some didn't have it on and i want to make it very clear you don't have to have the speed stamp on if there's one thing you take away from this video just remember that and then the firmware version that's the firmware on the camera i was testing now let's have a look at some playback options for the files you've recorded we saw earlier on obviously you can play back the video on the camera itself on that nice big screen you can also plug in a mini hdmi lead which isn't provided into a suitable television you can see the um, live viewfinder here you can't record with the HDMI lead plugged in. It won't let you do that, but it will let you get through the various menus on the camera. You can see here, I can get into the different settings, but the important thing, the real reason that you're plugging that mini HDMI lead in there is to get into the video playback. And of course, just like the screen on the camera, which it's replicating, it enables you to play back the videos on the larger screen. Now, if you plug the camera into your computer, see this mass storage thing comes up, you have to select OK to get it to work. So make sure you do that. Then this blue screen comes on and it works like a memory card reader. Now you could, of course, take out the micro SD card out of the camera, which is what I normally do, but it's buried right down in there. So to get it out, you're going to have to sort of dig in there, bit of a fiddle, better off just taking the camera out and plug it into your computer instead. Now, once you've got it on your computer, this is what it looks like on a Mac. You can see we've got two files here. Well, a folder and a file. Let's have a look at this file here. This is a text file, and I'll zoom up a little bit so you can see. That's my 0 to 60 times there. You can see the one next to the bottom, the 0 0.7 seconds. I'd probably delete that, and then the camera would forget that that was the best time it had achieved. And it's just a text file. I just save it and put it back on the camera. I presume there'd be lots of other things on there if you'd done a lot of other lap tests and all that kind of stuff. So if you went home from a track day, all your information should be in that text file there. 
In the other folder here, you'll find all your video files. You'll also find another folder in this one which has your locked files in. But if we just look through these video files, first of all, you can see they're all MOVs. They're all about the same length. That's because they're two minute files. I'll just play one on screen just to show you what that looks like. It does look a little bit jerky here. And that's because I'm capturing the video and that tends to add this kind of jerky effect. It reduces the frame rate. But anyway, while we've got the computer on, let's just have a look at the bit rate of one of these files. So I'll just click on open one in QuickTime, have a look at the movie inspector, zoom in on that. And let's look at the data here. You can see towards the bottom, we've got data rate 15.26 megabits a second. Now ignore the current size at the bottom. That's the size of my screen real estate. See the size of the file at the top 1920 by 1080. So if we just remember that uh, 15 point whatever it was, I've already forgotten megabits a second. And we go and have a look at a nighttime uh, clip because that should have a different megabits a second if it's a variable bit rate. Look in the moving spectra up there. Zoom in again, and now that was the number, wasn't it? 15.26. So basically, it's a fixed bit rate, whether it's day or night. And that information will be interesting to somebody somewhere. Now, inside the box, you get that mini CD with the software on. Probably much easier for most people to go onto the website and download the software from there. It's called DOD Player version 2.0, available for PC or Mac. Whoops, should have said Windows or Mac. There are people out there that will go crazy if I say PC instead of Windows. So to those people, calm down, take your hands away from the keyboard, breathe deeply, you'll get over it very soon. Now, as you can see, the software on screen here seems to be working okay. We've got the video at the top left, got the speed information below that, G sensor information, averages in the middle there, files at the top, uh, map data pull through from the right hand side. But the problem is, it takes forever to load the video files in at the beginning. You sat there for a couple of minutes watching the little things spinning on the screen while it's loading them in. It shouldn't take that long. It's pretty poorly processed programmed I think it won't even go full screen for goodness sake it needs a complete overhaul in my opinion now on a Mac I would normally view video files in a program called dash cam viewer now the GPS information is embedded within the MOV files and this particular program can't read the format of information that's being output by this camera as you can see the map isn't there etc the same issue happens with registrator viewer on Windows it can't read the GPS information out of those MOV files either perhaps we're in a different file format or something maybe that software will be updated over time you can on a windows pc of course use the dod software which works just like the mac as in it does work but it does need some improvement as well Right, let's finish this video off with some scores and a conclusion about the DoD Champion SP1 Motorsport Dash Cam. Well, as far as the camera itself goes, I've got no problems with it at all. Everything seems to be working fine. It's exactly as I'd hope it would be. It's got good video performance. All the features on it seem to work fine as well. That software I mentioned on the Windows or on Mac needs work, but that's not the fault of the camera itself, and those things can be updated. Now, the only thing that might be an issue for some people is the price. It is quite an expensive dash cam, and that's because of those motorsport features. And if you're not going to be using those, I'd suggest that you might want to look at another camera in the DOD range. The LS460W seems to offer pretty much all the features of this cam other than all those motorsport ones. So if you don't need them, maybe this is a better camera for you, and it's quite a bit cheaper as well. Now, if you want to know the up-to-date prices of the SP1 or the LS460W, there's links up in the video description and in there you'll also find links to those downloadable sample clips that you can try out on your own computer but that's it for the moment as always thanks for watching